We're going to read from God's Word now. So if you wanted to turn through to Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 47, that's Mark chapter 15, verse 33 to 47 in the Pew Bibles in front of you, otherwise it'll be on the DP behind me. Mark records, when it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, forgive the accent, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, see, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, fixed it on a stick, offered him a drink and said, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. Then the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who was standing opposite him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There are also women watching from a distance. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and Joses and Salomon. In Galilee, these women followed him and took care of him. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem. When it was already evening because it was the day of preparation, that is the day Before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went to Pilate and asked him for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had already died. When he found out from the centurion, he gave the corpse to Joseph. After he bought some linen cloth, Joseph took him down and wrapped him in the linen. Then he laid him in a tomb cut out of rock and rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were watching where he was laid. Uh, We are in week four of our series in the Apostles' Creed, titled The Foundation of Our Hope. I'm not going to spend long here, just to simply say that each week I have been zealous to communicate the fact that the foundation here is not the creed. The, the foundation is what the creed points us toward, which is Scripture. Scripture is our foundation. We are Grace Bible Church. We love the Bible. Creeds are not Scripture, but creeds do point us towards Scripture, and that's what creeds are designed to do. They remind us that the Bible should be systematized for us to better understand it. So that's one of the reasons that uh, the, the church has historically loved creeds and confessions Uh, throughout church history is because in order for us to understand the Bible and what it says, the Bible's teachings must be systematized. And that's simply what a creed is, a systematized way to consider the Bible. Now, we're not going to go through standing and reciting the creed. Um, We have a lot to get through, so why don't we get straight into prayer to our good God and Savior? That better? Okay. How's that? Murray will tell me in a second, uh, and then we'll pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you now. We thank you that that rugged cross is our salvation, where your love was displayed and poured out. Father, help us now as we consider one of the deepest and greatest topics in all of Scripture, Christ bearing the wrath of God in our place. Father, in light of recent events in the world, we do ask that we would use the message today of Jesus dying for sinners to bring hope into a world that is literally in chaos and panic, a world that is seeking answers in a time of crisis. And so we ask that we would be salt and light to the nations around us. Fuel our heart's desire for you. Through your word now, we ask and pray in the precious name of Christ. Amen. You shall measure the height of his love by the depths of his grief. You shall measure the height of his love by measuring the depths of his Grief. These words are the insightful attempt of 19th century pastor and theologian Charles Spurgeon 
who was trying to communicate the idea that the height of God's love, if that can ever be measured, can only be measured by the depths of God's grief, if that can ever be known. The boundless grief that God the Son experienced 2,000 years ago when he hung on a tree for sinners. You shall measure the height of his love by measuring the depths of his grace. This morning, friends, we come to the part of the Apostles' Creed that has caused no small controversy in the church. The doctrine we're about to see here this morning is one of the most gloriously beautiful yet highly debated topics in all of Christian history because of the nature of its topic or what it is. It is the topic that Theologians have called, now I will define it and we will say it lots of times in the sermon, but this is the doctrine that they call penal substitutionary atonement. Penal substitutionary atonement. This is the doctrine, the biblical idea that God the Father has poured out his wrath upon the Son in order that the Son, the legal substitute, takes our place bears our guilt and becomes accursed for us. Why would anyone want to reject that? I have no idea, but they do. Friends, our sin righteously demands the just judgment of a holy God. That is what Scripture repeatedly tells us. And God's law will not allow sin to go unpunished. God is too holy to allow that. And so the only solution to our sin is a legal substitute, one who is worthy of dying in our place, who is at the same time simultaneously sinless and yet still a human being, still a man. One who is both totally God and yet totally man. Penal substitutionary atonement. That is what the authors of the creed are saying in this line. Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, buried, and he descended into hell. And, and without so much as the blink of an eye, the authors of the creed have, have just, like that, glossed over 33 years of Jesus' life. Did you see that? From womb to tomb, from the virgin birth to now the sufferings under Pontius Pilate. That's how quickly the creed covers the ministry of Christ. What, why would they do that? Why would they leave out the life and ministry of Jesus? And I I think the simple answer is that the authors of the creed understood what the writers of the Gospels understood, that the main thing about Jesus' life was Jesus' death. The main thing about the Gospels is the Gospel. There is nothing more central to the Bible than the message of the cross, and nothing more central to the message of the cross than penal substitutionary atonement. So let's get into it with the main point that we're going to see. Jesus Christ endured our eternal hell on the cross so we could enjoy his endless heaven. And we're going to see this in two points, the sufferings of Christ and the crucifixion, death, burial of Christ. We begin now with point one, the sufferings of Christ. And we're going to go back to the first part of Mark's uh, chapter here in 15. Have a look at Mark 15, verse 1. As soon as it was morning, having held a meeting with the elders, scribes, and the whole Sanhedrin, the chief priests tied Jesus up, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. And then verse 15, and Pilate, wanting to satisfy the crowd, he released Barabbas to them, and after having Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. So as we saw last week in the birth account of Jesus, that the birth of Jesus takes place in history and in time, now his death is likewise taking uh, taking place in history and in time. Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate. Why his name? Why is Pilate mentioned in the creed? Why Pilate? Why not suffered under the Sanhedrin who put him before Pilate? 
or suffered under the Roman soldiers? Why is it Pilate's name in the creed? Well, I like the answer that R.C. Sproul gives. Pilate was the governor at the time that Jesus was crucified. He was the historical Roman governor at that time. So the name of Pilate is there to remind us that the gospel, the, the good news of Christ, takes place at a real time in real history. It reminds us that the gospel is not just an idea, but a reality. It is a story that centers upon characters who were really here. In the words of Ben Myers, the confession centers upon a name. Unless we begin to think that the name of Jesus is some theoretical concept, the creed now adds a second name, Pontius Pilate. So Pilate is there to remind us that God has acted in history, at a particular moment in history. That's the first reason this man is mentioned in the creed. But secondly, his name is there to remind us that he, Jesus Christ, suffered. He really suffered for our sins, both physically and spiritually, because sin has both physical and spiritual consequences. And the physical is what we see here in verse 15. After having Jesus flogged, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. Every year it was the tradition of the Roman governor to release one Hebrew prisoner from Roman custody during the Jewish Passover feast. Now this liberation of a prisoner was seen to be sort of a goodwill gesture toward the Jewish nation to let them know that Rome respected and honored the Jewish religion. And so normally in this process, the Roman governor would release uh, one Jewish prisoner who had committed relatively minor offenses, ones that weren't really worthy of a public execution. But, But this year, Pilate decides to do something different. He, he, he decides to change the tactic up a bit. In order to dissuade the crowds from killing Jesus, Pilate chooses the worst criminal he has in holding. He, he chooses the worst, most notorious criminal so that possibly the crowds would see the comparison. Are we going to let a vile thief and sinner go free, or are we going to let a man who's kind of deluded and really just claiming to be God to go free? So in order to dissuade the crowds from killing Jesus, he chooses the worst criminal. And the worst criminal that year was a notorious man by the name of Barabbas. And he was notorious, friends, in every sense of the word. His villainy and crimes were both detestable and known throughout the empire. Mark refers to him as an insurrectionist, In verse 7, John describes him as a thieving crook in John 18, and Luke records him as a murderer. If he were alive today, the word we would probably use for Barabbas is a terrorist. He was a known terrorist. And he deserved to die the worst kind of Roman death, death by crucifixion. So surely, surely these Jewish people were not going to anger Rome by releasing a genuine threat to the Roman Empire, right? I mean, surely they had more sense than releasing someone like Barabbas who had broken their own law of God, thief, murderer. But as we have so often seen and as Scripture repeatedly tells us, sin has a very real way of blinding human hearts. Verse 13, they shouted, crucify him. But Pilate said to them, why? What has he done wrong? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. And Pilate, wanting to satisfy the crowd, handed him over, Jesus over to be crucified. And he let Barabbas go free. Phil Johnson makes a wonderful point at this moment. He says this, that here then is a vivid living illustration of the principle of penal substitutionary atonement. Christ literally died in Barabbas' place. On a cross meant for Barabbas, taking the punishment Barabbas actually deserved, while Barabbas himself went free. 
Now, that doesn't mean that Barabbas had true and saving faith in Jesus. But what it does mean is that in a, in a true and literal sense, Barabbas could actually say, Jesus Christ died for my sins. Literally, he took my very cross. That cross was reserved for Barabbas. And Jesus takes his place and Barabbas goes free. No doubt this is an intentional picture on the part of the gospel writers to communicate the gospel itself. That when you and I place our faith in Jesus Christ, in a very real sense, he takes our place. He bears our curse. He dies our death for our sins. Penal, substitutionary Atonement. Barabbas is the picture of the redeemed sinner. And then in verse 15, Mark describes what the authors of the creed are getting at when they say that he suffered the physical beatings. He was bruised for our iniquities. Pilate released Barabbas to them, having him flogged or scourged is another way to say that. Christ was beaten physically beaten. Now, according to Roman tradition, those who were to be scourged were to be scourged by being tied to an upright post and stripped down naked in order to expose the sensitive parts of their backs. After which, the Roman executioner, known as a lictor, would grab his Roman whip, the Roman whip being the flagellum, flagellum, specially designed whip Fashioned for one purpose, pain, pain, pain. It was made from a specially designed leather and it had small pieces of of bone and metal, jagged bones and metal attached to the very ends of the whip so that when the lictor would whip his victims, it would take off pieces of flesh. The church father Eusebius tells the story of Christian martyrs who through having this Roman scourge take place, had their veins ripped from their backs and the hidden contents of the body, bowels and organs were exposed. They were experts at torture, friend. So much so that the prophet Isaiah could say of Jesus, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man. His form was beyond appearance that he did not resemble a human. Isaiah 52 verse 14. So after Jesus was subjected to this public scourge, Mark informs us he was taken to the Praetorium Hall, or as Mark puts it in the CSB, the governor's residence. And it was there that they would call the whole company of men. That is one-tenth of a Roman legion or 600 Soldiers, 600 Roman soldiers had their fun with this one prisoner. In fact, history informs us that many of the Roman soldiers who carried out these public scourges day after day after day would be so accustomed, they would get so used to doing these things that they actually started to become bored. And so to keep themselves from becoming bored and to keep themselves entertained, they would turn these scourges into a public spectacle of drama, a kind of Roman play for their own sick sanity and entertainment, dressing their victims up and mocking them in the process. And that's what is happening in verse 17. So they dressed Jesus in a purple robe, twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on him. And they began to salute him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They were hitting him on the head with a stick and spitting upon him, getting down on their knees. They were paying homage to him. This whole process was a sarcastic mocking of the person and work of Christ. Mocked as prophet, mocked as priest, mocked as king, Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. But he's still not done. After this, Mark informs us that they compelled a certain man by the name of Simon of Cyrene to bear the weight of the cross of Christ. And the the language that is used of compulsion in verse 21 here was used of animals that were coerced to go ahead to their slaughter. 
Simon is literally being coerced or forced, like an animal being led to the slaughter, to carry the cross of the Lamb of God being led to the slaughter. And the point that is made here was that the physical sufferings that we have just witnessed was so horrendous, they were so gruesome that Jesus could not even bear the weight of his own physical cross. No doubt this is intentional on the part of Mark to point out the irony of the one who would say for others to take up their cross while he himself could not even do that very thing. As R.C. Sproul has rightly said, the very first person in history to take up a cross and follow Jesus was Simon of Cyrene, and he was not even a disciple. This whole thing stinks of irony, mocking, and shame. After this, they brought him to the place of the skull. In Aramaic, this place is called Golgotha. In Latin, they would simply call this Calvaria, a medical term referring to the top part of a human skull. So whether in Latin or in Aramaic, this location was notoriously known for death and repulsion. This was the place of the dead. And it was here at this location that the Roman soldiers would accomplish phase two of the creed. That is Golgotha. I thought it changed, but it didn't. That was the place of the skull. And it was here at this location that the Roman soldiers would accomplish phase two, crucified, dead, and buried. Have a look at verse 24 now. Then they crucified him, divided his clothes, casting lots for them to decide what each would get. Now it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. Now as I was reading that, did did anyone notice the lack of description in the crucifixion? Almost as as if it's just a matter of fact. They crucified him, let's move on, right? What is the reason for the lack of description in Mark's gospel? What is the reason that the cross of Christ is so undetailed in its detail? Well, on one level, I think the recipients of Mark's gospel would have been very familiar with a Roman crucifixion. They would have seen Roman crucifixions as often as you and I see the evening news. They were very familiar. In fact, it was customary for the condemned prisoner being led to the crucifixion site, Golgotha, to be carried, uh, to be walking through the longest possible route through the city, making it clear to the greatest number of people that insurrection toward the Roman Empire was futile. It was futile to rebel. And so they would have known all of the gruesome details that a Roman crucifixion would entail. So, so Mark has no intention of describing this in every detail because they were familiar. But, but on another level, I think he intentionally leaves out detail because there is something going on in the crucifixion. Something more than just mere physical pain, friend. There is something more than just a man being crucified on a cross. Something spiritual, something, something theological that is happening here in this crucifixion. And that is what Mark describes in verse 33. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? It was midnight at midday, says Spurgeon. Midnight at midday. There is darkness at noon. And in his book on the Apostles' Creed, Mark Johnston gives us a helpful reminder of what is going on here in these verses when they crucified Jesus. He says this, that when Jesus was put to death on a Roman cross, not only did all the Jews see him as accursed, and not only was there just chaos and confusion and disorder going on that day, but there was something else that was filling the air at Calvary's Hill. Something that was filling the air. The divine displeasure of God. The divine displeasure was filling the air, he says, at Calvary's Hill. 
And that is seen most clearly, this divine displeasure is seen most clearly in two things that Mark points out here in these verses. Firstly, it's, it's, it's seen in the sweeping darkness that covers the land. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land. This is what John MacArthur calls God visiting Calvary. Throughout the scriptures, friends, God uses darkness, physical darkness, as a means and method to communicate his holy fury and his wrath. Think, for instance, of Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Darkness covered the whole land of Egypt for three days, and for three days, no one could see anyone else or move about. God was displeased and angry with Pharaoh, and so he sent the plagues, and one of the plagues were the darkness. In the book of Amos, chapter 8, the prophet describes an eerie darkness that can only come as a result of the wrath of God. He says, and on that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. And just listen listen to the description that Isaiah gives of the darkness of God in chapter 13, verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel and with wrath, fierce anger, for the stars of the heavens will not give their light, and the sun will be dark at its rising. The moon will not shed its light, and I will punish the world for its evil and wicked for their iniquity. Darkness is a sign of divine judgment. And it would seem to me that this is, is, is at the heart of what is going on here at the cross of Christ. God is visiting Calvary with the judgment and the wrath that our sins deserve. But where is the judgment falling? It's not falling on the Roman, um, the Roman um, centurion or the Roman guards here because they're still breathing. They're still able to carry this out. It's not falling upon uh, the Jewish people who are wagging their heads. Come down, king of the Jew. It's not falling upon anyone else but Jesus, the sinless son of God. See, as he hangs there on this tree, there's this looming darkness, the terrifying darkness on the earth. And again, John MacArthur is helpful when he says this, the darkness of Calvary did not represent the absence of God, but his holy and terrifying presence. His holy and terrifying presence. I mean, think about it. This darkness comes at a time and a place when when we are least likely to expect it to come. Because we know this is Passover, because we know the geographical location of where this takes place, and because we know this is probably around the time of spring, there are no natural explanations for this darkness. There is absolutely no explanation scientifically that can account for this darkness. So it's almost as if this darkness comes at a particular time and place so that no one would misinterpret what this darkness represent. And so I think it is quite clear that this darkness is a representation of God's wrath looming upon the cross being poured out upon Christ. The divine judgment of the wrath of God was falling upon sins, friends, and Jesus was bearing that wrath. And we know, we know for sure that he was bearing the personal wrath of a father because of what he says in verse 34. The second sign of divine displeasure, at three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but Jesus actually makes seven statements on the cross in other gospels. Seven statements he makes, and yet Mark gives us but one of them. Why would he do that? Well, I think, again, this is another obvious sign that Mark wants to bring us to the meaning of the cross, to the significance of the cross, to the fact that the cross is the very wrath poured out upon the Son, that he is wholly forsaken by God and exposed to the full fury of of his anger. In his commentary on this verse, William L. Lane 
writes a helpful statement when he says this, that this cry of dereliction, this cry of abandonment that Jesus faces, it is the inevitable sequel to the horror he faced in the Garden of Gethsemane. We remember Jesus is praying, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup of the wrath of God that is about to be poured pass from me. And this cry on the cross must be understood from that perspective. This is the sequel to Gethsemane. Sin separates us from God. Sin is the very source and substance of all that God hates and the opposite to all that God is. Did you catch that? Sin is the very source and substance of all that God hates and the very opposite in nature to all that God is. God is holy and he cannot look upon sin. And Jesus was forsaken by his father because of our sin. He became a curse for us. Galatians 3.13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us as it is written in Deuteronomy Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This was the main point of the cross. This was the very reason Christ came to earth. This is the heart of the gospel, the source of our hope. Jesus Christ was accursed. Now let me say something real quick, because this is important to clarify as we're here at the heart of the gospel. This abandonment by God was not an abandonment of one of essence or one of nature. There is no rupture in the eternal oneness of the triune God. The Trinity is not being divided here. But rather, as our sin is laid upon Jesus, God the Son died according to his human nature in our place. This is a very real picture of the separation, not between God and God, but God and man. There is no enmity between Father and Son, but rather as Christ, as our substitute, dies in our place, he feels that separation that sin brings. The distance that sin creates, which signifies that he really did take that personal wrath. This is yet another evidence of penal substitutionary atonement. This is a simultaneous picture of the wrath of God, that he is withdrawing his presence making Jesus feel abandoned, but at the same time pouring out his wrath upon Jesus. And if you wouldn't mind me getting a little bit more theological for just a few more moments, I'm going to bring to you two words that are at the heart of penal substitutionary atonement. Two ideas that needed to be said. The, the debt that needed to be, to be paid was being paid by Christ in two ways. The debt that needed to be paid was being paid by Christ in two ways, propitiation and expiation. Now, what do they mean? What do these terms mean? Propitiation is the glorious idea that, that the wrath of God was being fully satisfied, being fully appeased, because Jesus was sufficiently Payment for our sins. Isaiah 53.10 speaks of this. It pleased the Lord to crush him. Jesus is crushed. The wrath is appeased. Propitiation. But then secondly, expiation is the idea that our sins are fully and finally removed from us. They are removed from our account and they are placed upon Christ. Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And so these two realities, friends, propitiation and expiation, are what make the gospel good news. These two things are the very source and substance of the gospel, and they stand at the center of penal substitutionary atonement. You take these two things away, you do not have good news. Without these two realities, there is no salvation and there is no forgiveness. We need propitiation. We need expiation. And we need to understand the wrath of God falling upon the Son 
Otherwise, we do not have good news. How is it good that Christ died if we don't understand our condition? If we don't understand the predicament that we are all in? We need the wrath of God to make sense of the cross. Without the bad news, the good news becomes no news. So we need to understand this in light of penal substitutionary atonement. Shortly after the close of World War II, there was a man by the name of Gunther Rutenborn. He wrote a play. It was originally performed in Berlin, and the crowds of people flocked throughout all of Europe to come out and watch this particular play. On one level, it was an exceedingly disturbing experience. Its purpose was to answer the question, who was responsible for the Holocaust? The tone is set in the very first scene as actors made clear that they were not the ones responsible. The housewife, for example, she was just trying to make ends meet with a few meager food stamps that had been given to her. And the businessman, he wasn't responsible for the Holocaust. He was just trying to faithfully meet steel quotas for necessary living. Even the SS trooper denies any responsibility. He was just following orders from his superior officers. So any blame, therefore, must be higher up. But what makes this such an eerie thing to see, dear friends, was that this, in this opening phase, all of the actors would walk among the audience of the crowd and they'd make eye contact with them, asking them, did you know about it? Did you hear about it? Were you aware of where the trains were going? I mean, you could feel the anxiety of these people as the actors walked among them, asking these questions. And again, all of the actors respond the same way. I didn't know what was going on, hadn't a clue. But then the second time around, later on in the play, things began to change. Well, yes, said the the housewife. I, I had heard something may have been going on. And the businessman in the steel industry, he, he acknowledged that, yes, he did know something about train schedules and there were these certain trains that were always given priority. And so person after person, story after story, more and more people began to admit that they all knew something that ultimately, finally, all of them knew, all of them were aware and that they all were in on it. But even at this point, the famous line of the play was that the blame is higher up. The blame is higher up. And so they decide that the blame must be laid at the feet of God himself. God, if he really is the one who is in charge, and if the Holocaust could happen on this planet, it must be his fault. And so they decide to put God on trial. And God is found to be guilty. And someone asks the question, what will be his punishment? And one of them says, let him be a Jew. Another man says, I lost a son in the war. Let him lose a son. And a third actor responds, let him die an agonizing death as a criminal on the cross. Gunther Rutenborn, you see, friends, was a Lutheran pastor. He was a pastor who was actually trying to communicate the message that God bore a debt on the cross, but not because he was guilty, but because we were, because we are guilty, because we are guilty of sin, guilty of treason, guilty of sedition, and and that the only way to escape the wrath and fury of God is penal substitutionary atonement. If you take away his wrath, you take away the cross. The cross does not make sense without his wrath. Scripture promises, brothers and sisters, that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. All those who commit sin must die from that sin. But the thing is, friends, that Christ died, but he never once committed sin. So if if Jesus never once committed sin, but Jesus dies for our sin then the idea here is that Jesus paid for that sin by taking on the wrath that sin deserves. It makes perfect sense. The wages of sin is death. Jesus never sinned, but Jesus really died, so Jesus bore the wrath. He died and he was buried for our sins. That's what the authors of the creed are getting at when they say that he died and was buried. 
This whole section goes together. He suffered, he was crucified, he died, and he was buried. His death, his burial remind us of the result that sin brings, death. Death physically and eternally. And there is nothing more real, nothing more serious than a graveside service in a cemetery. And that's what we see in verses 37 to 47. When Jesus let out a loud cry, he breathed his last. He really died. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That curtain that represented the separation of God and man, that that is now torn, indicating that the payment was made, it was sufficient, God the Father accepted, his wrath was appeased, our sins were expiated. Verse 42, when it was already evening, because it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went to Pilate, asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate was surprised that he had already died. So summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had already died. And when he found out from the centurion, he gave the corpse to Joseph. And after he brought some linen cloth, Joseph took him and wrapped him in the linen, and then he laid him in a tomb cut out of the rock and rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. He really died and he was really buried because he really took the wrath of God. And perhaps, friends, perhaps this is no more clearly seen than in the final clause of the creed and that confusing statement, he descended into hell. What does that mean? Well, today's the day you get to find out Roy's understanding of what this phrase means. So here's my two, three minute summary of descended into hell. Given the nature of the physical torture of Christ, the beatings, the whippings, the scourging, the spitting, the mocking, the pain, the anguish. Given the spiritual suffering, the abandonment, the wrath, the darkness, the fury, the separation, the grief. Given all of these things, the mental, the physical, the spiritual, what word would you use to describe that event? What phrase could we come up with that would justify the absolute agonies of Calvary? Well, I think the authors did it pretty well when they described this in one word, hell. Hell is the only reasonable word that can describe the agonies of the cross. Hell is the most accurate way to describe Golgotha. And listen to Mark Johnston again on the creed when he says this, the blessed one who for all eternity had known nothing but the highest heaven and intimacy with God, has now plumbed to the deepest depths of the anguish of hell on the cross. The intensity of what that meant is distilled in those words that pierce the darkness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So although he did not descend to the literal physical location of hell, it is right and it is theologically accurate to say he descended to the depths of hell. That is, he descended to the depths of hell by having the full weight and wrath of God poured out upon him, which is literally describing the essence of hell. But in this case, On this cross, Jesus would not have a mediator in his place. He was the mediator. He was the sacrifice. He was the absorber of that wrath. And so I think Calvin is spot on when he says that the entire section of the creed, from suffered under Pontius Pilate all the way down to crucified, dead, buried, that this next phrase that he descended to hell is summarizing all of those things. He went to hell on the cross. He endured hell on the cross. He descended to hell on the cross, not literally or physically, but spiritually absorbed hell. In order for Christ to take the curse, he needed to be accursed for us. 
This is penal substitutionary atonement. This is the glorious doctrine that is at the heart of our Christian faith, friends. And in the words of John Stott, let me finish here today with this great statement. John Stott says that God does not love us because Christ died for us. Christ died for us because God has loved us. He does not love us because Christ died for us. Christ died for us because God loved us. And there are some in the church today, friends, people in Brisbane City and beyond, who would deny this boundless heights of the love of God. They would try to come up with a way of explaining away the judgment of God, explaining away penal substitutionary atonement. But do not be deceived, friends. Without the wrath of God, we do not have a gospel. The cross no longer makes sense, and all you have are atonement theories that do not change human hearts. Penal substitutionary atonement is the heart of the gospel. And it is what we preach here day, uh, week in and week out at grace. And take away that, you do not have the gospel. His cry on the cross stands as a sobering reality to all those who think that keeping God at a distance in this life is a, a choice worth making. Jesus Christ endured our hell so we can enjoy endless heaven. And so the authors of the creed are telling us implicitly that you and I need penal substitutionary atonement. We need to come to Christ and receive amazing grace. This is how deep the Father's love was for us, friends. That he would send his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be flesh, to be sin on the cross for us so that we, the guilty Barabbases, would go free. You shall measure the height of his love by measuring the depths of his grief. Let's pray. Gracious and amazing Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to see so clearly in your word and in the creed, Lord, that, that you loved us. You loved us to an extent that you were willing to condescend to us in our likeness, in our humanity, in order that you may take on the punishment that sin deserves. Father, may this message be the very, the very soul-changing message of the people here today. Whether they are Christians or not, I pray that it would affect freshly, once again, each and every person sitting in these pews. Pray that it would affect me, Lord, as I seek to minister to my brothers and sisters. May this be the foundation of of my ministry and our ministry here at Grace as brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask now as we go out into a sin-riddled, virus-riddled world that we would be salt and light, bringing a message of reconciliation to the world. And that message would be so clearly seen in the legal substitutionary atonement that Christ accomplished in our place for our sins. We thank you so much, Lord, so much that that wrath has not fallen upon us because of Christ. And I pray for anyone here who does not trust or is not trusting in Christ, that they would so that that wrath would not fall on them, but upon Christ or upon Christ. Help us now, we ask and we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.